everyone listening to this podcast has probably seen like the documentary with the talking heads and you know inter intercut with like footage like news footage or whatever and then you know chuck clusterman shows up or henry rollins shows up or <laughs> dave Grohl shows up and you know it, it's it's a mix of like interviews with the band members cut with like you know outsiders giving context or whatever and this isn't that film this is the, the interesting thing about the way that you handle this film is uh, i mean of the other many interesting things about the way you handled this film is that there are interviews with several members of earth many 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 people who've, who've gone through the band as well as like you know producers label heads things like that and there's footage of some of those people but the footage isn't of the interview like this isn't a talking heads kind of kind of documentary this isn't behind the music yeah i mean at its at its heart this movie is like i don't know if you've seen the film gates of heaven by errol morris but it's a movie about a pet cemetery and there is a scene where one of the sons who owns the pet cemetery goes up on a hill with his guitar amp and he just plays guitar licks and they echo over the valley of the pet cemetery. And I just like, ever since I saw that scene, I was like, this is the most glorious scene in a film I've ever seen. Like, what is this? What is this hippie doing standing on a hill <laughs> in California playing Jimi Hendrix-esque riffs over a pet cemetery. And it just really, it's like in my heart, <laughs> that shot. So, you know, when I thought about making a film with Earth, like I was like, it's, it's going to be like that. I'm going to take the Northwest and I'm going to make it a character in this film because it's a huge part of our lives living in the Northwest. All these people, they're all affected by the weather and the like insular nature of you know hiding in your home for nine months of the year and i don't know it just it just it just affects everyone up here so so much so i wanted to like elevate the northwest as the primary character of the film and and to do that i thought about all of the different wildly beautiful locations that we have here and then i would take one band member to a wild location like the Stonehenge recreation on the Columbia River Basin and I would like make him play music there and film him or I took Jonas Haskins to Rattlesnake Lake which is a beautiful lake just miles from the town Twin Peaks was shot in and it's just one of my favorite lakes but I had never been in there in the winter and I took him up there and I was like stunned because it had the water had receded so far away we had to like haul this dinghy like over the mud for like an hour to get to the water and then i made him like row a dinghy out into the lake with oars made of electric guitars that had been donated and i know this all sounds vaguely abstract at this point on a podcast but that i i mean I, i'm glad that you brought it up because if you didn't i would that is that is my favorite scene in the whole movie and you know the whole thing is almost like a little three act play where he's at he's at the lake with the canoe and he's got the two guitars that are tied to oars yeah and in your in your head you're doing the math <laughs> right like you know two two guitars canoe lake is he is he going to is he going to get into the canoe with the guitars and then row with the guitars? And but the whole thing is, you know, he, first he first he creates a landing, and I think he actually stumbles a little bit, right? And it almost looks like at some point he's going to fall into the water. Yeah, I mean, it's all just documentary. <laughs> <laughs> I thought he was going to go in too. It's like David Attenborough, right? Like you can't you can't interfere. You just have to set up your camera and watch. Yeah. And then when he gets into the canoe and starts rowing with the guitars, it's almost like it's almost like a kids in the hall sketch. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Like it's almost like this very absurdist, surreal, very funny moment where you're like, who is this guy and what is he doing? <laughs> like, I feel like like 
there's a whole movie about Jonas Haskins, you know, rowing. The movie intercut with like Jonas Haskins rowing to like different locations. Yeah. And he just shows up yeah. with, with his canoe. Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, each of these like scenes is is very intentional. Like Steve Moore at Stonehenge, Steve is a math music nerd. He is deep in it. He can like draw sound for you in many different mathematical shapes and equations. So like Stonehenge is the perfect fit for him. And that was like a really epic trip. He had been on tour for like months with this band from Sweden. We picked him up in Portland after their last show at like 2.30 in the morning. He slept for like an hour in a hotel room. And then we drove him to catch the sunrise on the Columbia River. And it, I mean, it was a brutal shoot for all of us. Like we drove down from Seattle. We slept for like an hour. He was off tour and slept for like an hour. And then we drove a couple hours along the river and to get there before the sun rose to shoot and one of the interesting aspects about these scenes is that some some of them were actually soundtracked by those members like they contributed music for their scenes yeah it was so fun to make this soundtrack i wanted the project to be as collaborative as possible without like putting the weight of production on them so I basically handled the filming and I mean, the whole approach was just like to let earth tell their own story, like however they wanted to tell it, like, which is not necessarily like a traditional documentary approach, but I don't necessarily love a traditional documentary. So we shot film for like two and a half years on and off and again this is like a passion project so it wasn't every day we would just you know choose a weekend go out with one person and we'd often be driving like a few hours so you know that would kind of be the shoot for the day or for the week or we'd organize a show we did a launch show at the crocodile and dylan had like every local member of earth come and play on a song and it was really fun it chronologically kind of presented it was so sweet and that was that was kind of like the beginning of soundtracking was we did a live recording of this of this live earth show then we filmed for a couple of years and after that i started to rough edit the film together and i met with dylan and adrian and told them like okay we've got kind of like seven scenes seven or eight like scenes and here are the themes to them like tour on the west coast grunge olympia aberdeen like the olympia aberdeen years the seattle years so thematically like they were given kind of an assignment to make music that like represented these time periods or geographic locations and so they kind of like handled that aspect of the soundtrack. And then we all went to Mel Detmer's studio in West Seattle. And they worked with Mel for about a week recording that music. During that time, we also brought in like individuals who were featured in the film to make their own soundtrack for their section of the film. Because I wanted to be like really representative of each person and like, what they bring individually to earth because earth is very, very much like, well, it's very much Dylan and Adrian's project. It's, it's also very much a collective of musicians and it's deeply influenced by like what each, each person brings to the band. And you can, you see that shifting throughout the years. And so like just inviting that in one more time was really magical in lots of ways. Like, I think like one of the highlights was is for me is Angelina Bal Baldos's soundtracking. She brought in like a trumpet and a bowl of water and a delay pedal and a bass guitar with like two strings or something. And we just sat in the control room with Mel and we were like, what's what's about to happen? <laughs> and she made this gorgeous looped 
atmospheric piece, which is like so completely her style and so abstract. And that's like, you know, where she comes from. She doesn't really come from like the roots of a, a trained musician. She comes from a very experimental place. So like, just like, I don't actually identify like as a great musician or a great filmmaker by any means. I think my skill set is actually like understanding and acknowledging different people's strengths and just like stepping back and letting them shine and like serving as a placeholder for those people to do what they do best and like making space for it. I think that's actually my craft. So yeah, it's really fun. Yeah. Uh, but there's an aspect of that too, to great filmmakers. Like, I mean, not everyone is, you know, Stanley Kubrick yelling at you to do something 220 times until he gets the performance he wants. Sure. You know, like Scorsese is, is incredibly collaborative to the point where, you know, large, large portions of the scenes are, are just improvised and it's just his, his actors, his characters interacting with his mom because he, he thinks that would be funny. He thinks it would be interesting to see what happens when he throws his mom into the mix. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, as far as the soundtrack goes, you know, soundtracks for documentaries, especially music document documentaries, can be tricky because the music is the music rights are tied up with a lot of different companies, especially a band mm -hmm. like Earth that's been around for 30 years, um, even if the band members are on board with the documentary and you know the labels are on board with the documentary that doesn't necessarily mean that you can get the rights to the music was it was it difficult at all to to secure some of these songs we actually very intentionally approached it as a brand new album to avoid this exact issue and so i was like well wouldn't it be so great if we walked away with a brand new earth record at the same time and so that's what you get with the film is a entirely new earth record with the exception of a live version of bees made honey in the lion's skull yeah it was it was very intentional to avoid any issues with securing rights but i, I feel like it was it's just a bonus prize to have a whole new earth record and also like this kind of ties back to traditional music documentaries. Like, I I want to watch a film and be left with a lot of questions and then get to do my own research and get to... I want it to be more like a door opening instead of like, you see the whole room and then you leave the room and you saw what you just need to see or whatever. That's not a great metaphor, but... <laughs> Well, it does feel like a documentary for fans of the band Earth. Like, I don't know if people who aren't familiar with the band will, you know, will walk away from this documentary understanding more about Earth and why they're so, why they're so seminal in, in you know, certain types, of certain types of music and within that scene. But definitely as a fan of the band, it was interesting to see, you know, you know, hear from the record label who who originally put out the album, or you know, a lot of the collaborators and their their experiences with Dylan. I mean, I can say as as a fan of the band, I and and I have I have spoken to Dylan on this podcast before. We we spoke in twenty nineteen. Nice. And you know, as as a fan of the band, there's always been this mystery around Earth, and part of it is you know them being an instrumental band to make this incredibly avant kind of metal and never really fit in one scene or another and dylan himself is is kind of a almost like an outlaw musician kind of character you know what i mean yeah and so watching watching the documentary and having his friends or his his collaborators talk about him as a redneck talk about him as a nerd it was like seeing the other side of this guy who i only know from his like you know ominous uh album cover photos <laughs> and you know his incredibly ominous long drawn out songs Absolutely. Yeah, I, I well, I have a lot of thoughts about that. I don't know what people will think if they watch this movie and don't know about Earth because I, I don't have the opportunity to like be a person experiencing that. I think that this movie is like for musicians for sure. Like 
it's a two hour film about people talking specifically about playing music and what it means to them individually to play music and play collectively. And it does get into like some real detailed minutia about that. And so if if you're a person that is used to a different kind of film and, and wanting a different kind of scene, it might not be for you. But I want it to be like for people who are interested in going further. And like once they leave the theater, they like go and they look up the band and they learn more and they start listening. You know, I just want it to be like this little bit of an entryway into like for newbies, an entryway, but for fans, just like another layer on uh, revealed. I definitely think it's like the film is a time capsule in many ways. It doesn't, there's, you know, there's a lot of like early drama with this band that it doesn't go into for a number of reasons. Like some people did not want to be interviewed. And I definitely like, want to acknowledge that like some people like don't want to go back in time to times that were potentially like pretty hard and like pretty brutal like a lot of people died during grunge they lost so many friends and so it's like a pretty emotional journey to go all the way back there and like think about where you came from as a teenager and like all of the people that you lost along the way. So within that scope of the film, like I just tried to make it as much of like a time capsule of what was available. And that's just kind of what translated out of it. You know? Yeah. 